My name's Steve. I work at Hargis Ansam. Uh, I've been at Hargis Ansam for seven years and we're an investment management company. So um, people invest their money with us. They can put it into ISAs, pensions and, and pick stocks and shares. Um, and I work in digital marketing as part of our business. Um, so my responsibility is to help our website work as well as possible when it comes to people looking to open accounts, uh, invest, that sort of thing. At the turn of the year, I decided I wanted to explore my faith a bit more proactively and it was probably around six or seven months now that I've been regularly going to, to Metro. And uh, I started to just be thinking about my faith more in my day-to-day -day life as a result of that. And one particular talk, uh, we spoke about God in the workplace and that made me think um, what would a FTSE 100 finance company look like uh, run by Jesus or, um, you know, how, what could we do instead of making rich people richer? You know, that's a bit cynical, we help people look after their money, that, that's not a bad thing, how, how could that look? Um, the following day after that talk, uh, one of my friends at work who's also a Christian and was one of the few people at work who knew I was a Christian, uh, grabbed me and said, have you got five minutes? And we had a little chat and he said, I want to run an alpha course of people at work, do you want to help? And I sat there and thought, no, absolutely not. Um, but timing wise, I, I just, it just felt like this is what I was supposed to do. Um, so I kind of explained to him how sort of nervous I was about the idea um, of publicly saying, hey everybody, I'm a Christian and I'm going to talk to you about being a Christian. Uh, and then I begrudgingly said yes and we kind of, we, we took it from there. With the of course of running at work, um, we've, we've managed to get a meeting room in the building that we can have for one lunch hour every week. Um, we'll buy lunch and we'll just uh, watch one of the other videos with people and spend half an hour or so discussing that. Um, and then every few weeks we'll take it outside and we'll go for coffee and discuss some of the things perhaps people have further questions about. Um, we kind of expected that we'd have two or three people and we decided that we, were, we would be happy with two or three people if they were still coming by week six, week seven. Um, eight weeks in now we've got eight people who are regularly turning up which is uh, yeah, beyond my wildest <laughs> expectations of what might have happened for myself, of course. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got baptised and we saw that as a really sort of nice opportunity to say to the guys on the Alpha course, hey, look, come along and see what this church is like. And it was kind of a reason for them to come to church. And um, three of them came along, uh, along with three other of my friends. Uh, none of those six have church backgrounds. Um, and I think everybody was surprised by, by what they saw. Um, and, and really enjoyed it. And I can remember one of them in particular who it really resonated with. And I could tell because we walked out and he was telling me, I think it really resonated with that guy. And I was there thinking, wow, it must have really resonated with you in, in that case. Um, and sure enough, he texted me the next day and said, do you know what, I really enjoyed that. I'd like to go to church again uh, next Sunday. Um, and, and so he did, we, he couldn't do Sunday evening. So I went to Woodlands Church uh, last Sunday morning. And again, he came away having uh, just just buzzing, uh, having really uh, felt the talk, spoke to him and, and really felt like he was starting to get towards towards the answers to some of the questions that he had been asking. I've always believed that God can do amazing things, but I think I've not always believed that God would do amazing things through me. Um, and I guess the Alpha Course has been something which, for me, as I said, has been way beyond what I could ever have expected. And I know that that is not because me and my friend are turning up and doing it ourselves, that's, that's God in my room. Um, and that's been my prayer before every Alpha course, not make sure people turn up or make sure we talk when it's just been God, just turn up and be in my room for, for this hour. And I guess on a wider scale, that's my, um, my prayer for, for, for my for business I work in. And also the city I live in is, um, do you want God just, just be in this, in this business, uh, not for an hour at lunchtime, be in this business. You know, Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. To, to 6 p.m. when everyone leaves on a, on a Friday um, and, and beyond that. Um, go with these people in, in, into their lives and, and into this city. Um, and what excites me is going from thinking that would be nice to thinking that, that that could happen.
So the others is revolutionary because it says that Jesus doesn't just use the stars. Sometimes we have the perception that the kinds of people that Jesus uses are the ones that have it all together. They're the people that you see on the stage. They're the people that uh, know their Bibles. They're the people that never mess up, that never fail. But Jesus uses the ordinary people. He uses weak people. So here's a little recap of uh, this chapter that we're looking at over these three weeks. Luke chapter 10, it says this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Everyone say others. And sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And what he says to them, he says this. He told them the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. The issue is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we learned last Last time that Jesus has these others, they are not the 12 apostles, they're not the 12 disciples, they're people that you haven't heard of, people that you've never come across, they're nameless, they're faceless, but these are ordinary everyday people like you and like me. And Jesus says, I can use you, I can use you tremendously because the harvest is plentiful, there is so much out there that you don't realize, there are so many people that are so close to God, and if I could just have workers, everyday people, farm hands, unskilled, willing laborers who would just get involved with my stuff, then these people could come to faith. And so we say that weakness isn't a problem. Your weakness isn't a problem. Your weakness is what qualifies you. For these guys, the fact that they were the others means that they were not the eighteen. They weren't the chosen ones. They weren't the named ones. They're the regular ones. They feel weak in themselves. They feel like they can't do anything. And actually, Jesus said to them, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. I want you to feel weak. If you've got um, a bag, I want you to leave it behind. If you've got sandals, I want you to take them off. Because I want you to be aware that you're weak. Because strong people that go out trying to represent Jesus usually make a mess of it. Put your hands up. How many of you have seen Christians make a mess of sharing Jesus with other people because they've just been inappropriate, too strong, too brash, too bold, too arrogant, too cocky, too judgmental? Put your hands up. We've experienced it. We've seen it. Some of you have been on the receiving end of it. Some of you are here tonight despite the fact that someone has done that to you. And maybe you're not sure about faith. Maybe you're on the outside looking in. But Jesus says, that's not the way that I roll and that's not the way that I want to use people. I want people to be weak, humble, gentle. And so last week we talked about being weak. We talked about weakness not being a problem for Jesus. Weakness is the very thing that qualifies you. And Steve's testimony, that story is a perfect example of someone that feels, I'm completely weak. I'm only doing the alpha course because I was kind of maneuvered into it. I had no choice. Every bone in my body screams, don't do this. I don't want to do this. I feel weak. Someone who'd only been just going to church for six months before he starts reaching out into his weak workplace. But God uses weak people. So this week we move forward, and this is my favorite thing. This is my absolute favorite thing. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're not sure about this, or you're finding your way back to faith, you just need to know that when we talk about the others, we're talking about Christians sharing their faith. And that's interesting for you to find out how we do that and why we do that. But this thing is interesting now for everybody. Whether you've got a faith, whether you don't have a faith. If you're thinking about faith, this is the most important thing that you can hear. It's about the kingdom. And Jesus says, look, I'm sending you out in weakness. That is not a problem because the message that I give you, the mandate, the mission that I give you is so unbelievably transformative. It changes the world. It is the greatest thing ever. God's kingdom. He says this, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal those there who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God. Everyone say the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. 
And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. So what I want to talk about for just a few moments is this thing. It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. In other words, the dome, the domain, where God is king. This is the most wonderful thing in all of Christianity. This is the most wonderful thing that Jesus spoke about. If you don't know anything about Jesus, you just need to know that when he came, he came proclaiming the kingdom of God. He says this is good news for the world, good news for humanity, good news for men, good news for women, good news for the young, good news for the old, good news for the rich and good news for the poor. We've been singing about this. This is God's brand new kingdom. This is God's rescue package. This is God's dream. This is our heart's yearning cry. So when we pray the Lord's pray we pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy thy kingdom come why do we pray that why have christians down the ages down the centuries down millennia prayed god may your kingdom come because the kingdom of god is the most wonderful thing you can experience and i can tell you that in terms of beer i don't know if it's a beer i'm not quite sure about beer carlsberg is it beer or is it lager I can tell you in terms of lager. <laughs> because I know about lager, and I know about beer, and I know about Carlsberg. I know this about Carlsberg. I know that last, at the turn of the century, just about 10 years ago, Carlsberg did the, what was widely regarded and counted as, uh, by the end of 2010, when we got looked back over the first 10 years of the 21st century, uh, advertising executives got together and they voted for the best advert of that entire decade. And the one that came in number one was an advert by Carlsberg. Carlsberg did this incredible advert. Now, most of you are you're, you're young, you may not have seen this, but I remember when it came on, it was a big splash. Not only was it across all TV, and in those days, we used to watch TV. Uh, it was before Netflix, it was before YouTube, and it was just this thing called television. And everyone watched the same stuff, and you couldn't fast forward it. You just had to watch, and then they would put these things called advertisements on. And so you'd watch these advertisements, adverts we called them. And uh, this one particular one, it came on the television, but it also came on in the cinema. And you saw it in the cinema screens before the film, before the trailers, this thing would come on. And you'd see this scene. It's an early morning. There's a little minibus and it putters along a residential street. It picks up a guy who's waiting to be picked up. And while he's waiting, he's just dribbling a football. He's an older guy. His past, uh, his prime is, is in his past. But he's brought into the minibus. And there's minibuses full of old guys. And as you look, you begin to realize these old guys, every single one of them, including the driver, they are all legends of British football. The English football lions. The English football heroes. Some of them from that 1966 World Cup final when English finally and never ever again did something half okay in football before embarrassing themselves for the next few decades. But these were there, they were Bobby Robson, they were Jack Charlton, they were uh, younger ones for, or more recent ones like Chris Waddle. There's a whole, every single person there was one of the old English lions. And they pick up more people as they go through and they get to the minibus, they park up in a pub, they go into the football pitch and they start playing five-a-side football. And they're playing five-a-side football in this outdoor pitch against a normal pub team. And because they are the England heroes, even though they are well past their prime, uh, some of them are in their 60s and 70s, they are just still magnificent. They are doing wizardry on the pitch. They are going up and they are just making magic happen. They're running rings around the opposition. One goal goes in, another goal goes in, another goal hits the back of the net. They're giving high fives, they're cheering. There's just, not just a a physical excellence about them, but there's a lightness and a joy about them as they're having banter between them, and they are just, it's like 15 nil by the end of it. And then you see them all in the pub afterwards, drinking Carlsberg. And the voiceover comes, and it says this, Carlsberg don't do pub football teams. But if they did, they would probably be the best football team in the world. Carlsberg. 
And there was a whole series. That was the main one, but there was a whole series of them. There was about 10 different adverts in this whole campaign. It was leading up to uh, the 2006 uh, Euros. And it was just the most incredible thing. One of them was a bunch of guys, and they're sort of in their early 20s, that are dressed scrappily. They're in torn jeans and uh, trainers. And they walk up to this posh nightclub. The bouncers there on the door, two big hefty bouncers. They look down at their shoes, and they instantly know they're not dressed for a nightclub. They have not met the um, cr criteria of the dress code. The bouncers say, come in, lads. We've been expecting you. And they go in. Now, I've got to apologize for this because the scene that greets them is, is completely and utterly inexcusable. I mean, it, it is misogynistic to the extreme because every single woman in this uh, club is like, you know, these just fantasy women and this was done because these guys were aiming pretty much at 14-year-old boys. And so, you know, I don't think they'd get away with it today. But it was, I just like to say, I, I completely did not endorse this. I, I want to distance myself from it. But it was kind of funny. And um, they just, every woman wants to, to, to dance with these guys. And every other woman wants to bring them a, a Carlsberg. And so they're sipping Carlsberg just surrounded by dream women. And then the voiceover, Carlsberg don't do nightclubs. But if they did, they'd probably be the best nightclubs in the world. And then there was my favorite one, which was a guy knocks on the door of a flat and uh, he's looking for a room. And they say, ah, oh, come in, come in. And this uh, extremely kind of cool, handsome guy shows him in and says, hey, I'm, um, I'm one of the flatmates here. Love to bring you in. Let me show you. I'll introduce you to the crew. And he introduces her to um, one of the women who lives there. She's like a kind of supermodel look, but she says, ah, oh, that's Jess. She's a model, but she is also a trained chef, and she won't let anybody else cook around the house. And uh, introduces uh, him to another guy who's like this incredible guy, the, the guy that you'd want to be friends with, just amazing. And then takes him into this room. This is his room. And it has got a massive flat screen television on the wall. And uh, it's got a PlayStation there. It's got basketball. And it has a balcony. And you go out onto the balcony. And the balcony is overlooking Wembley Stadium. And there's a game playing. And the voiceover comes and says, Carlsberg don't do flatmates. But if they did, they'd probably be the best flatmates in the world. Now, this campaign was done by Saatchi and Saatchi, and it was voted the greatest advertising campaign of the decade. And it was called, they did a little release about it, it was called The World According to Carlsberg. The World According to Carlsberg. They said, we want to explain ourselves. We want to show that this whole passion was to show what it would be like if Carlsberg applied the same delight and excellence and professionalism and passion that they do to lager to ordinary things in life. So what would it be like if Carlsberg did a pub football team? What would it be like if Carlsberg did a nightclub? What would it be like if Carlsberg did flatmates? They would probably be the best in the world because that's the world according to Carlsberg. Now, like I said, it was, it was pretty exploitative and low and I'm not completely sure if Carlsberg would do the best nightclubs or they would do the best flatmates. But I'm intrigued by this idea because I feel like it, it explains something that is very, it's very hard to better this. But the kingdom of God is the world according to Jesus. That is, imagine, imagine, imagine if Jesus did business. Imagine if Jesus was running your business, which is what Steve said in that video. Imagine what Jesus would do if he ran a Fortune one, a FTSE 100 uh, finance company. What would that company look like? It would probably be the best finance company in the world. Because Jesus would be there, and his mercy would be there, and his grace would be there. And people wouldn't be exploited, and people wouldn't be used, and people would be lifted up, and people would have their potential fulfilled, and the money would be used for good, and it would be stewarded well, and there would be a generosity of spirit, and it wouldn't be about perpetuating inequality and injustice in our society, but it would be about releasing people and using money for good. Imagine the world according to Jesus. If Jesus did finance, what would it be like if Jesus did education? What would it be like if Jesus did uni? What would it be like if Jesus was on your course? 
Those of you that are studying right now. I mean, how would he be as uh, someone that was studying or someone that was in your hall or someone that was in your flat? He would be the best student in the world. He'd be the best flatmate in the world. What would it be like if Jesus did local government? What would it be like if Jesus did politics or the arts or media? What would it be like if Jesus did community? There wouldn't be any lonely people. There wouldn't be any heartbroken people. There wouldn't be any marginalized people. What would it be like if Jesus did our streets, if Jesus did our neighborhoods? There wouldn't be racism. There wouldn't be this kind of sexism. There wouldn't be ageism. There wouldn't be people discriminated on the basis of, of gender and age and social status or anything. The world according to Jesus. Imagine if God's grace as shown in Jesus Christ was in evidence in the places where you go, the place where you live, the place where you work, the people that you know. What happens? What Imagine if Jesus did a nightclub. If Jesus did a party. What would be the best party in the world? And if you want to know what that looks like, <laughs> Friday night, Spike Island. What would it be like if Jesus was on the decks? If Jesus was there in the party going from person to person and just talking and, and, and relating. And you'd come and you'd think, Jesus is a pretty good mover. And also I am healed. You know, what would happen if Jesus got to do... And so Jesus says, this is the kingdom of God. This is the domain where Jesus is king. This is hope for the hopeless. This is release for those in captivity. This is breakthrough for those that are addicted. This is an end to violence. This is an end to hatred. This is an end to wars and division. When Jesus comes, we don't erect walls between nations. We tear those walls down and we have a hand extended. We have arms open wide. If Jesus ruled the world, if Jesus was able to do his life, his passion, his grace, his mercy, if Jesus was there, if Jesus was your boss, man, you'd like working in that place. If Jesus was the guy that you line managed, you'd just like, you'd feel like the greatest boss ever because you have the greatest worker with you. Just imagine. And that is God's dream for humanity. And Jesus says to the disciples, to these others, to these regular, nameless, faceless people, He says, I want you to go and I want you to tell people God's kingdom is here. The, the, the fuse has been lit. I've lit the blue touch paper. So it's here and it's coming in increasing measure. It's not here in its fullness. It's now and it's still to come. It's now and it's not yet. But it's breaking in. And as soon as Jesus gives his life on the cross, as soon as Jesus comes and pays that ultimate sacrifice, he brings in this brand new kingdom. And now there can be forgiveness. And now there can be mercy. And now there can be grace. And he says, I want you to go. And that's why he says, look, you can be as weak as you like because the message is strong. Go in. Eat what they give to you. So be there. Be submitted to them. Be in their world. Be humble. Be submissive. But then, heal the sick. Heal the sick and tell them, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. The kingdom of God looks like sick people get healed. The kingdom of God looks like tears are wiped away. He says, you've got to proclaim it and you've got to demonstrate it. So you demonstrate it by healing the sick and you proclaim it. And you say to them, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. I don't care what order you do it in, as long as you do them both together. We're not supposed to just tell people, God's kingdom is come. We're supposed to show them, and it looks like this. And we come and we go to our friends and we pray for them. Some of you, you're going to go out from this place and you're going to lay hands on your friends that are sick when they tell you. And you're just going to say, look, can I pray for you? You know I talked to the big man upstairs. Is that okay? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. What have you got to lose? Let me just pray. And you pray for them. And then you say, how do you feel? And they say, actually, yeah. I can move it completely freely. That's so weird. And then you say... Well, that's God's kingdom. That's what happens when Jesus gets to be involved in your life. And that's what Jesus does when he gets involved in your sickness, in your pain, in your hurt, in your brokenness. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than telling people and proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom of God. 
The time that I first got super excited about this, I was just in my mid-twenties, and uh, I was working, uh, going around and working with different churches. I was in this one particular place. It was in Coventry. And they put me in this rough, rough, rough housing estate, one of the roughest housing estates in England. And I figured, okay, well, I eat what they give me. I go to where they send me. They put me in a house with two little old ladies. They were actually incredible women. They were in their 80s. They were sisters. They had never married. They had been missionaries for all their lives, and they lived together. They loved together. And they were the beating heart of this rough housing estate. And kids would come from all over the estate to to see them and to talk to them and, and to have cups of tea in their kitchen. One day, I'm there. And I'd been in schools, and so the guys sort of recognized me. And they knew the, 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 the women uh, that I was staying with. And so they, they knocked on the door, and they said, hey, can we come in? Two guys. There's one guy that was kind of tall, and there's one guy that was kind of short. And they walk in, and uh, they say, hey, Philip, preacher guy, will you pray? Will you pray for us? Pray to your God. And I said, what's the issue? And then the, 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 the guy that's the tall guy, he, we're sitting down. He gets the, the young guy. He says, show him your arm. And so the, the guy comes up and he, he goes like this. And he shows me his arm. He says, do you see what's wrong? And I said, yeah, something looks really weird, but I can't quite put my finger on it. And just take your arm. Take your wrist. And you see, feel around. You feel this kind of knobbly bit here, the end of your bone. Okay, you see how that's on the edge of your wrist. Well, with him, it was in the middle. So weird. And so uh, the, big, the little guy's not saying anything, but the big guy says, listen, uh, my friend, he hurt himself, and uh, he was really badly damaged. Um, he fell down a hill in the woods, and he broke his arm, and uh, it didn't get set properly. We, we didn't get it sorted out quickly enough, and it's now set improperly. So he can never move his arm properly. He's got no full range of movement, and uh, it gives him pain, and uh, it's, it's not right. And uh, I can't help but feel a little bit responsible because I pushed him down the hill. (laughs) Will you pray? And I say, sure, I'll pray. And um, I'm thinking, Jesus, what can you do? I'm just, I'm one of the others. I'm very aware of my weakness. But I remember what you said. And I remember, Jesus, that you use weak people, weak people to do incredible things. And so I took his hand in my hand and I put my thumb on this uh, whatever you call it. Doctor in the house, tell me what this thing is called. Malleolus. Malleolus. Is that right? You just made that up? (laughs) The malleolus. Okay. I put my thumb on his malleolus. And I pray, I say, Jesus, you're the coming king. You're the coming king. You're the one that brings hope. You're the one that brings healing. You've died for the sins of the world. You've died to beat sickness once and forever. And one day when your kingdom has fully come, there'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be no more broken bones. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. No more crying. No more dying. We will be with you, Lord God. And I want to grab a hold of some of that kingdom and bring it down into this kitchen in Coventry. Do this, Lord God. And as I held my hand on his malleolus, it started to move. And it moved from the center. As I put my thumb, it just moved under my thumb until it was right there where it should have been in the first place. And I said, try moving your wrist. And he's like, I can move it completely. I said to these boys, would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ? (laughs) Because this is the kingdom of God. Is it because there's anything special about me? No. I am weak. I've always been weak and I will continue to be weak. But I rejoice that God uses weak people. Jesus loves to use weak people. And this is why if you're not a follower of Christ, if you're not in on this, you want to be pushing in hard. You want to be running, straining to get into this. Because those that follow Jesus become this ordinary, easy to underestimate army of regular, ordinary, ragtag believers who do extraordinary things. Because Jesus says, I am going to allow you to bring my kingdom in. There's a great harvest and you will pull the kingdom of God into your situations. You'll pull it into your workplace. You'll pull it into your flat. You'll pull it into your friendship groups. You'll pull it into your family. You'll pull it into your studies. 
These guys that became Christians, they told their friends, the kingdom of God is here. Their friends became Christians. The week after I left, I found out from the ladies that I was staying with, they, they sent me a letter. We had letters in those days. And uh, the letter said this. Uh, James had gone with his friend, and he'd gone with his parents because his parents were baffled and amazed. And so the parents had taken him to the uh, hospital. He'd had an x-ray of his arm because they said, we want to find out what happened to his arm. The x-ray came back and it said these words. This young man has never broken his arm. There's never been any break. We find no evidence of it. These charts do not tally. And we say the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has come. And that is what Jesus does. He uses weak ordinary, regular people. You say to me, Philip, how does he use this? I say to you, I will tell you next week. <laughs> when you come next week, what we have is we have today, uh, yeah, let's move on. We've had, um, last week we looked at who, it's the weak people. This week we look at what, what do they do? It's the kingdom, they proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom. And then next week, we're going to find out how, how you do that. What is the secret? We're going to finish up the story of the others. And we're going to find out not only did the demons submit, not only were people healed in the name of Jesus, but Jesus says, this is why it works. This is how it works. And we're going to see you guys commissioned with some of that. So you've got to come back. And if you love them, bring your friend because they can get in on this too. Because we're going to pray together and we're going to receive what Jesus wants us to have. But right now, you've got the second ingredient. The first ingredient is weakness. Everyone say weakness. The second ingredient is kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. Because the kingdom of God is God's dream for humanity. You know, back in the 70s, John Lennon, he wrote a song, Imagine. It's a brilliant song. It's an amazing song. But he has this line, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. But Jesus has his own version of that song. And he says, actually, there is a heaven, the kingdom of heaven. But imagine that there's no barrier between heaven and earth. Imagine that this kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the place where God's will and God's purposes and God's dreams are made manifest, that comes down to my patch of planet earth. And so Jesus says, listen, this is my heartbeat. This is my dream. This is why I can use you. Because the kingdom of God is my dream for people. It's people released. It's people free. It's people loved. It's people being the fullest them of themselves. Meeting their potential. It's about us together loving one another. It's about us never dying, never crying. It's about us having the life of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the passion of God, the fire of God, the power of God. It's about He. It's about wholeness. And right now we live in the tension because it's not fully here. But Jesus says, the more you go, the more you pull it into the earth. The more you speak, the more you pull it down to the ground. The more you believe, the more you make it a reality. Imagine, imagine, imagine. Imagine Jesus in your flat. Imagine Jesus in your family. Imagine Jesus in your workplace. Imagine Jesus where you are. That, that's the kingdom of God. So we're going to pray, but first here's our big idea. The big idea. The kingdom of God is the world according to Jesus. It's our job to bring God's heavenly dream down to earth. Who wants to be a down to earth Christian? We bring God's dream down to earth. And so where God is and where we are, there is no separation. And one day the Bible says God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, heaven itself will come down to earth. And earth will be everything that it is supposed to be. But right now we're going to pray. And I want you to get primed for this because I want you to start to work out this stuff in real life. I want you to be able to go literally to your friends this week and look for the opportunity. And when someone says, man, my shoulder is killing me. You say, hey, um, a little bit odd. 
do you mind if I just pray? Because you know I've been talking about my faith, but it's not just something to talk about. It's something to experience. And, um, you know, maybe nothing will happen and then you can make fun of me and laugh. But who knows? And you're going to do it. And they're going to go, damn, that's the weirdest thing. And you're going to say, the kingdom of God is here. <laughs> but right now we're going to pray. And I'm going to pray for some of you right now and Jesus is going to heal you where you are. So I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to pray for those of you that are sick, physically sick in your body. And you, you know something, you've got it. It's a condition or it's uh, an injury. It's a pain and you're aware of it right now. And if, if that applies to you, uh, if you've got something which is physical and it's uh, affecting you, uh, whether it's a long-term thing or whether it's something that's just happened to you in the last few days, just put your hand up and we're going to pray. Okay. A few of you guys. Right, you can put your hands down. And uh, what I want you to do is I want you to put your hand on the area of your body where you feel the pain or where the issue is, as much as you can. If it's something like a blood disorder, then just put your hand on your heart. Um, Matt's been praying there's a couple of words uh, the first one is shamrock and an elbow I don't know what that means but if that means something to you then you'll know that God has been speaking to you uh, for someone else it's a problem with your socket joint it may be the hip and the fact is that there's no cartilage there and Jesus wants to heal that for someone else it's your spine it's, it's actually the C6 vertebrae and if that's you you'll know it You've been diagnosed, and uh, again, Jesus wants to touch. Um, someone's got chronic cold sores and infections in their lips. So I want you to just put your hand on your mouth. For someone else, this is um, a, a leaky valve in the ventricle in the heart. Um, you experience an irregular heartbeat. But if you've got one of those, I want you to just put your hand where that thing is. If it's something else, then you do whatever it is for you. But I'm just going to pray. And as we pray, I want you to receive Jesus' healing by faith. The rest of you, if, you're, if you've got nothing to pray about, then you just be quietly agreeing with me as we pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for your Holy Spirit right now to bring your kingdom in. We say, come, kingdom of God. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let heaven come down. May the coming king bring his healing, his wholeness, his power. And Lord, you said that these signs will follow those who believe. They will lay hands on sick people and they will be healed. And right now, those of us that are sick, we're laying hands on ourselves and we're believing in you. We're believing in you. We're believing in your word. We pray right now, in Jesus' name, I proclaim healing in this room. I proclaim the sick shall be healed. I pray that cartilage shall be restored, that infection will be driven out, that back pain gone in the name of Jesus. Blood disorders cleaned up in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move through this room, that you would come and that you'd fill us, touch us, and bring your wholeness and your healing. In Jesus' name we pray.